Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Wonderful. Great that still so many of you are here. I appreciate it. That's great. I know it's a long day. Um, it's been very uh, busy. And I have been going through different tables and I've seen wonderful discussion going on. So it's time now to report back to the entire group. So uh, in no particular order, I would like to ask if there is any um, group members who would like to come. I would like to ask you to please at least one person to come up here. And if you have different uh, things, you can put them in here. And as you talk, you can just uh, maybe stick them in here. So this way, people who are, you know, we are doing live as well too. And again, all of these are going to be used to do the white paper afterwards, right? So after this session is over, I will email all of you who have participated today. And I don't know if there is anybody here who are here without registering for the think tank. If you are, let me know so I can add you to the list of the people who have registered already. Uh, any group who wants to come, uh, to start, tell your uh, name of your group and then again start reporting. You want it perfect, wonderful. I will give you a microphone also, and you can have a maybe assistant somebody from your group if you need. You can take your perfect, and I can, I'm happy to help you. Katerina can also help you too. Yeah, whichever you want. I'll give you the. Um, so, this group, and please also introduce yourself too. Okay, I'm Susan Fon, hello, and I'm representing the group that focused on the role of the teacher. And we had a, a, a rather spirited conversation in the beginning, and we're tossing about uh, numerous ideas. And we kind of came down to the thought that what we were talking about is whether or not, <coughs> pardon me, the teacher was, <coughs> pardon me, whether or not the teacher was approaching from a transformative or a transactional approach. And so we listed a couple of items that we felt identified the teacher as having a primarily transformative role, that of mentoring, um, giving attention to the universal, universality of education, facilitating the learners, uh, teaching students how to learn, being more constructive, formative, in a coaching role, also serving as a role model, and then of course in uh, including critical thinking skills as a primary function of teaching and learning in the classroom. Then with respect to transactional, we identify that perhaps technology seems to drive us to very tra transactional approach, or it has the potential to drive us to a transactional approach. So that we might be thinking that we're simply there as an observer or enabler when we want students to collaborate together. Or we simply transfer knowledge. So the students pay money to take the class, we transfer the knowledge, so that's kind of transactional. Uh, that we conduct assessments uh, using technology, grading, for example, using technology, that transactional becomes very rubric driven. Sorry, I'm an attorney, I talk really fast. I'm trying to make myself slow down. <laughs> I tell my students it's deliberate because we don't want people to understand anything because then they won't have to pay us. <laughs> Anyways, um, that we are basically providing tools from that transactional perspective and data is a strong uh, intervener when we're on, using online instructional methods. So that's kind of how we set up what we saw the role of the teacher in this transformative versus transactional. And we even had some conversations after we kind of made the T chart that perhaps we should look at this as a continuum as well as a T chart. Because there might be various times in your career in which you need to be purely transform transformative, but there are other times where it's, it's you know reasonable to simply be transactional with the students. Did I miss anything, group? And group members, feel free to uh, add. So, in light of our identification of the transformative versus transactional framework, we then identified several research questions that we thought might guide our efforts in this area. Uh, we struggled a little bit with this one because we're thinking there could be both uh, qualitative inquiry as well as quantitative inquiry. So we talked about how or how or can technology assist in designing curriculum that results in positive student outcomes 
regardless of class size. There was uh, quite a bit of talk about the fact that sometimes you might have a class of 70 in an online environment, other times you might have 20, and that might really alter the interactions and what you can accomplish with your curriculum and as an instructor. Um, our next question was, in an era of technology-driven education, how do, it, how do educators impact and transform student learning? Uh, we weren't as familiar whether or not there was sufficient literature on this so far, and we thought maybe a good area to do further research would be taking up this question, particularly about how technology is kind of driving education and the narrative might seemingly be getting away from us as educators. So if we want to have uh, some more influence or voice in the process, we should in fact try to ask a question like this. The next question we had was, what is the educator's role in student learning that is situated in an online learning space? Um, again, I think that's going back to our vision of this as transformative or transactional, and really asking very deliberately that research question, which one is it, or is it a combination, or is there something we haven't thought um, up yet? Next, we have the question, who vets the quality of instructional technology programs and what tools are used? I need help from my group on this one because I, I don't remember this question. Um, I think what we were trying to say was, as, as, um, as instructional technology and technology in general advances, the realm of what's possible widens. And so just because something's possible doesn't necessarily mean it's instructionally or educationally effective. So how should we judge whether what's possible is actually what's worth doing? Okay. Okay, and our final question, how will the quality of emergent instructional programs change in 30 years? Transformative, if you think about this from the leadership uh, literature, transformative would be where we are engaged collectively or collaboratively in the process of altering and changing you for the better and me for the better as a part of our relationship. So it's more relational, it's more positive based for both individuals in the, in the partnership or in the um, interaction. Whereas transactional could be simply as, as simple as Oh, would you like this green marker? That'll be a dollar. Thank you. And we're done. So transactional is simply I'm giving you what you've asked for in a very um, distant manner. There's no, there's no benefit beyond the actual transaction. Another way yeah. to think about it, too, was, was that um, a transactional model would be the, the sort of earning of a, of a credential, right? The sort of granting of a certificate or something, whereas transformative is kind of weird. Transformative is a uh, you know, yeah, an, an, an educational experience, and you describe that very well. Or we're changed somehow. Yeah, you're both changed. I it's have something that I didn't have beforehand. It's much more meaningful to be engaged in a transformative process. Yeah, maybe another way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it. Talked about Globes taxonomy. Um, we looked at uh, the first, the initial part is like the transfer of knowledge. That's very transa uh, transactional in nature. If you get into the evaluative part, that becomes uh, much more transformational and changing. Uh, so that's how you differentiate between transactional, it's any computer can do something with data. But can a computer uh, really have you evaluate and think and create? That's really the question. Well, one last thing I'd add is transformational is much more empowering. So the individual that you're giving that lesson to or instructing in some way becomes empowered through the, through the process. Rather than just learning a concrete skill, they become empowered. Do you have a comment here? I think the two of them too are in a continuum, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we can look at uh, transformational probably as a process mm -hmm. that is 
more process oriented, transactional is more outcome oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because it's through the process, you can go to the motive, motive side of learning, the dispositional side of learning, and then when you come to the transaction, what am I getting out of it? And what am I giving you to, to get something out of it? So, you can determine what that means. Thank you. Anything else? So, no more questions, I'll turn it to the next group. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we will take pictures of all of these posters there and I will send all of them back to the group later. So if you would like to refer to that, uh, you can. Uh, who wants to come as the next group to present? Again, in that particular order. So we have done with one group. We have a group here, we have a group there. Everybody's gonna have to present. <laughs> yeah. And if you want, please bring, I will ask Katarina to take pictures of these later. We can put them in, in here. Later you can take pictures of them. From that picture, you can collect them. Dr. Mori, are you coming? You have... Yes, okay. I'm, I'm trying to connect some um, group mates here to join me. Yeah, you can come all together if you want. That's all good. Whichever you want. So therefore, we're going to present or I can bring this to you. Could you? Well, I think that's what we're running into. Yeah, I can bring that. And we are flexible. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, you can stay there. We can bring that up there. And everybody can join, right? It's up to you, the group. You can ask questions, clarifications. This is the way, uh, this is the way we are really gonna get some juice out of this thinking that we had this morning. Okay. Please Thank be you. careful. Oh wow, that sticky is very sticky. Yes. <laughs> and maybe someone else should have gone because we're not organized. It's okay, we can go to Washington. Here we go. Okay. They, um, we have the topic of global cultural competence. And we defined global cultural competence as the ability to construct, interact, transact, transform cultural similarities, differences on a global scale while simultaneously acknowledging, promoting, value the seamless integration of DKS, which stands for disposition, knowledge, and skills in both local contexts and audiences. So, yes. So, in, in, in layman's terms, we will say that we, the goal is for students who graduate from higher education institutions in the United States to be able to um, interact, transact, and transform their um, learning through um, engaging in dialogue with others from other students from different countries. And if you can stop moving up. And while we also want them to be able to acknowledge the differences that exist, even in our smaller communities, but broadly, we want them to be able to um, promote the understanding and acceptance and value of differences. Because we feel that if this is the case, then that will enhance their learning. Uh, and it will enhance their ability to be productive in their particular uh, professions. Could you go down a little bit? So, this is what we would like to ask. How do you use, how can we use technology to develop students' global cultural competence? Um, we talked about some of the, you know, the areas that might cause us to 
um, cause a hindrance with that uh, development is that um, our institutions have our learning management systems that do not allow for cross-cultural, cross-country kind of collaboration. And if we wanted to include that with our students, um, that would not be acceptable. Also, it's difficult for, um, it's difficult for our students, uh, especially those who are local, I'll put quote, air quotes, to understand the rationale for it. Well, why do I need to? I just want to be in IT. That doesn't, you know, why do I have to? Because we feel that understanding and valuing what other countries can give to the profession will enhance their ability to be uh, the quality professional that they will become. And we want to, how do you differentiate global cultural competence um, for and among different uh, disciplines? We have educators here, those of us in teacher education. We have, uh, you're in STEM, right? And we have uh, linguistics, yes, language. So that differs. What does it look like for the future educator? What does it look like for the IT professional? Or uh, what does it look like for someone um, going into the hospitality field? And we also discussed that we can't do this in isolation. We feel that the university has to have a policy for faculty, staff, and students. Um, just putting it in writing so that it can be respected. That, okay, because sometimes, <laughs> excuse me, um, we, don't, we don't see the value in something unless it's like in writing, it's part of the policy. So we want to make sure that as we're emerging in this global time here, that it's something that the university's place in writing. And what are some barriers? to obtaining global cultural competence. We discussed some barriers, and one is that it begins with the self, and we felt that if uh, you have to work on your intrapersonal self-reflective skills and realizing that you know we are all different and that everyone has biases, no one's perfect, and that it's okay but we need to be able to understand that where our biases come from so that we can interact with people from different cultures. And if you'll move up a little bit, Kent. Thank you, John. We also want to be able to um, have our students interact with others. Um, I think um, John gave example of, and, uh, and also, our student Hawa and others gave examples of going into a different country and wearing this American like cloak. They're not going to assimilate. I'm American, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm American, but when you're in a different place, being able to sort of uh, uh, let go of some of your particular norms so that you're open to to how other people live and think. So that's basically what we would like to do because we feel that our future graduates, they should be consumers of knowledge rather than producers of knowledge. We want to maximize their knowledge, skills, dispositions, okay? So that they may become constructivists and transform and transact, divest, divest, thank you. <laughs> Their physical, virtu virtual, local, global, cultural identity. Thank you. Are there any further? When in Rome, it was the Romans. <laughs> but Rome was not built in a day. <laughs> Questions, feedback, please. Here. Did you say something more about you mentioned that you wanted students to be consumers of knowledge? 
to not produce the knowledge. Could you say more about that? I will allow John to speak on that. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Sure. Um, <laughs> in most of our classes, we have a curriculum, we have a syllabus, we have students to read the materials and come back and respond to us. So that takes me back to the days when, for that of course, educators used to believe that students need to come to the classroom to attain the knowledge. So you deliver on the, on the students' brains, on the minds, all the knowledge they need to know for them to come on Monday morning and then to uh, take the, the knowledge away from their brains in the way you actually begin to transact the knowledge. And oftentimes, when students only attain the knowledge, they never really think about how can I take this knowledge and gain a new heightened awareness, a new consciousness, a new level of consciousness when it comes for me to produce my own knowledge. And getting to that stage, that level of understanding, a new heightened level of consciousness, that takes transformative forces. Teacher has to be willing to step uh, aside from this notion that he, she has all the knowledge and the students are the empty, bus, uh, the empty vessels, floating down the river waiting for the almighty professor to impart upon the empty minds their knowledge. That is the only way, at least in my humble opinion, when the students actually not only just consume the knowledge that's given to them, but they actually start thinking actively about that knowledge and begin to produce their own understandings of that knowledge in an effort to provide new stimuli in the way knowledge is transacted around the world. And in that sense, also get a better appreciation for the different cultures, for the different viewpoints, for the ways people interact, act, and also oftentimes just simply transact knowledge. And um, also trying to get not only ourselves as faculty, but also students to understand that in the current world, there's no more domain where knowledge resides anymore. Knowledge is ubiquitous now, it's everywhere. And therefore, try to portray specific regions of the world as a bastion of knowledge. It, it, down the line, gradually, it's becoming a farce, really. Because um, appreciating that knowledge from China, knowledge from India, knowledge from Africa, knowledge from Europe, each of those areas of knowledge should be appreciated and therefore collectively used as a tool for cultural understanding, cultural engagement. Anybody else? Any other comment, question? I just would like to say something about global competence. I, um, watch a documentary about Chinese students in the USA. And uh, this documentary was talking to a group of Chinese students who have come to America, came to America, uh, for a Bachelor of Science Education, which is four years. Then they asked them, how many American friends or non-Chinese friends have you ever met throughout your four-year education? And they have said, none, oh my. zero with the exception of mandatory group. You know, sometimes the professor puts them in a group, and in those cases that they, so they, they come to America, they stay with Chinese people, they eat with Chinese people, they go to school with Chinese people, they speak Chinese, some of them. So, and I also know from my own students as well that it is human nature that whenever you go somewhere, you always would like to be associated with the people look like you, right? You never go to, at the other group, so it's it's nature. But we educators, and I'm sometimes thinking to myself, like I see, you know, in restaurants, I observe. As a matter of fact, I'm about to finish a documentary about the the impact of technology in eating. So I observe people um, in restaurants, and I can show you 1,000 pictures of a family with two kids and mom and dad that none of them are looking at each other. They are all in their phones. Have you ever seen this? Yeah. So speak of global competency. Maybe that kid is talking to somebody from Japan about a game or something else about lipstick, you know, the girls. They have amazing YouTube channels and stuff, but yet they do not interact with each other. So that's also puzzled me too. You know, maybe does technology help global, global competency? That's why Anahe is doing a study right now. We are trying to understand if 
um, taking any courses. You know, our university is a diversity requirement, right? So I teach a class called Food and Culture. So we talk about different foods from different religions, Jewish people, Muslim people, Hindu, and all that stuff. Does one class, one requirement enough to create global competency? Do, what do we need to do as educators to encourage that technology actually enables global competency or increases, not just defeats the purpose, right? So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy that you tackled those issues. That come to my, my mind, yeah. You have the microphone there, I guess, yeah. And I'm just gonna pick up from the first part of your statement, and probably approaching this from anthological perspective, or ethnographic perspective. In the process of participative cultural exchange, or competency exchange, there is always the invitee and invited in any cultural setting. And usually the invitee should be the predominant culture. Mm. The invited should be the minority. minimum minority culture. I hate using the word minority. I know, I know. Yeah. So, therefore, when you are in that arena, the person who is the invitee is living in the world of, I mean, the invited is living in the world of the invitee. And therefore, you don't put the responsibility of getting up to share that old milieu of the culture that that individual is trying to watch and study from a distance. The responsibility should be on the person who is supposed to be the invitee. Oh, come on, come on, participate with us. It's like if I throw a party, and it's an African party, Nigerian party, for example. And people who are not from Nigeria are there in that party. If we are all busy just doing our own dance as Nigerian, but that person will just sit down in that corner and observe us. And then we now expect that person to just get up and just join us. We've not taught him how to dance. We've not doesn't know the music. But if I go to that and say, hold your hand, come on. This is how we do this. And I do that with a smile and all of that stuff. That individual will get up. It makes things easier. So. I agree with you, and we need that a lot. I mean, I observe how intolerant people are, unfortunately, some of our students. So, you know, I remember when I used to teach in Oklahoma, I asked students, have you ever been abroad? So some hands come up and they're asking, where did you go? Or I've been to Arkansas. So they were thinking that Arkansas is another country, right? Which can I mean, it can is kind of like, I'm not gonna be the country. <laughs> When you mentioned the role of technology in global awareness or promoting global awareness, I mean, in many countries, people learn about America through their TV shows and movies, right. uh, rather than interacting with the real Hollywood. people. Hollywood. Right. Hollywood or, or even TV. Yes. yes. And so in, instead of interacting with the real Americans. And one of my students just mentioned earlier this semester that uh, she has interacted, she came here as a student, and now that she's interacted with some Americans, she believes that what she sees on TV is not true. Yes. yes. Anybody else want to comment on that group? Yeah, here, one more. We are good in timing. I also think it's important that the invite, the person that was invited to that country also um, has to show behaviors or characteristics that they're willing to step out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. to be able to do some of those things. Because if you look as if you do not want to participate, um, others in other countries may not see you as a willing participant. Um, I was in China for six weeks and I spent only time with um, people that were in that um, particular city or province at that time. There were American professors at the university that invited me to dinner all the time. I did not go to dinner with them at not one single time out of those six weeks. I chose to go with other students or professors or deans um, to see the from actual, their culture. from their culture, not choosing to go with um, my American professors, and to me, I think it's because you, sh you, when you show people that you're more interested in what they're doing, that care and that concern, and that community, trying to build that culture and that connectedness, I think they will feel more apt to invite you to things, because I actually am asked once to go, and after that, I was invited to go to everything, including a day of, a, it's called Children's Day, 
and they celebrate the entire Children's Day, and I was invited to go to the Change Assembly. So I think it's also the person, the willingness, and the desire, to, depending on, like they said, I think I thought they heard dispositions. What are some of your dispositions or biases as it relates to your desire to be open and willing to do those things? Absolutely, I agree. Cross-cultural education is very important. Uh, you cannot know how awkward is to hug a Chinese person in China. <laughs> you hug them and they are like frozen. <laughs> so cross-cultural education is important. But when you keep a business card, even those things are very, very uh, important versus when you come to America, all that stuff. Okay, uh, any other thing for this group before we go to the next group? Who's gonna be our next group? Here, you, okay, perfect. Do you wanna do it right here? Yeah. We'll okay, perfect, we'll get you the microphone. Uh, and my whole group is coming up there, just kind of standing Oh, yeah, there. perfect, so, right. wonderful. So my, uh, um, you can just fix it in the camera, I'll give that to you. So I'm a true clinical educator at heart, and I truly believe that the only way to build a culture is through communication, collaboration, collegiality, and so that's why my entire team is up here, not only to support, not only to support um, me, but we support each other as a unit, as a unit. And so that's why I asked them earlier to make sure they're up here as well, because this is truly not about me, but it was a collaborative effort between a group of us. And so we had, uh, we talked about um, social emotional learning as it relates not only to our students, whether it's PK through 12, but also our university students, in addition to adults as well. And so when we're looking at rethinking how social emotional learning and technology connects or doesn't, and how does we how do we continue to build those bridges that will allow social emotional learning to be more connected? And how can we continue to understand that if these bridges are not connected, we're gonna continue to see catastrophic things happen within our school systems, within our universities, as well as outside our homes and on a global perspective as well. And so these are some of the research questions we came up with. A few of them may be statements, but the majority of them are questions. And so the first one we came up with was, what does learning truly mean? Therefore, what is the desired outcome? What is our desired outcome when it comes to social emotional learning as it relates to technology? How do we engage our students that are truly wanting to learn, but how do we engage those students through a social emotional concept and context? The second one would be how do we develop the whole person or the whole child or the whole adult? And through social emotional learning, how do we continue to develop that individual? We have so many maladjusted adults these days. We know that comes from a lack of social emotional learning that was when they were in school. So how do we continue to develop not only the student academically, but how do we um, choose to develop them through a, looking at them through social, emotional, psychological um, ways as well? And can technology help us with that? Let's see, do we need to be social individuals anymore? That was a great question. Do we need to be social individuals anymore? Do we need to really sit down and have conversations? Do we need to sit down and communicate? We find a lot of individuals working in silos in 2019. Do we really need to come up and have conversations with each other? Some people may believe that we do, some people may believe we don't. I highly do not think that's effective. Um, however, other, people's may, other people may think that it, um, that it may not be as well or it may be well. Um, if we believe um, that there's a paradigm shift that is fundamentally desired to change an individual, or is this realistic via technology? So if you are, if, if we are desiring to change that, that entire paradigm shift as it relates to your mindset, the way that a person thinks about themselves, the way that they actually have their disposition. So if, you're disp if you don't understand your own dispositions, what are your own attitudes, values, beliefs, ethics, and morals? If you don't understand what those are within you, how are you gonna be able to relate to those students, those um, students in your classroom, or the students um, that you have in your university classroom, or your individual friends, how do you understand and able to connect with those individuals as it relates to that entire paradigm shift in regards to social emotional learning and technology? Um, number five, do we put too much focus into technology? Example, disconnecting families, friends, colleagues, critical thinking skills, um, creations, skills, and teamwork. 
So are we putting too much focus into technology? Um, we're putting iPads in front of students. We're putting computers in front of students. We're putting cell phones in front of students. We're putting, um, I don't have one, there's smart watches in front of students. Um, instead of putting people in front of students, are we putting those people that could actually make those connections in front of them? For students that are out of other countries, of course, that's a great tool to use, but students that are right next door, why aren't we putting those students together in groups so they can have real authentic conversations, so they can come together and collaborate, and they can disagree and understand how to have those discussions to disagree, and the importance of understanding of disagreeing with someone, and how do we move on from that. I think some, we had a discussion how technology um, disassociates students with the form of disagreement. Therefore, social media allows them to argue behind the scene, therefore never coming up with a solution or discussing the problem in a proactive manner. Therefore, it becomes a reactive manner, which relates to aggressive behavior. Number six, how can technology connect social emotional learning and the 360 degree model of learning and technology. And 360 degree model to me is just that whole continuum of services that we need to provide for students within our school system. So how do we look at that whole 360 degree model where we're providing services for them, not only social, emotionally, academically, and, um, and achievement-wise, but what are we doing with the community? Are we doing asset mapping? Are we doing community mapping? Are we reaching out to services that our students need and that could support them throughout their entire educational process? And all of those things need to happen concurrently. Not one because this breaks out at this moment, so now we have a fire over here and let's send them that way. Or now there's a fire over here, so let's send them that way. These things need to happen in continuum and concurrently so that our students remember and remain successful. Number seven, what is the purpose of educational technology when working with students and parents in trauma? And so how are we, or if we can use technology as it relates to students that are having some social emotional needs, <laughs> as it relates to school or home. How are we using it to connect with parents? How are we using it to help those students that are in those environments, those trauma-induced environments? Is it a perfect place to use it? Uh, the little girl in the video that we watched earlier that came out in the snow and her teacher was sick um, is an example that I'll just use. How, do we, how, how are we connecting that young lady happens to say, I didn't see a parent around, clearly, she was home by herself, if that's what it appeared to me, that she was home by herself. But what else is going on in that picture? So we saw that brave example of her going out into nature, creating, um, co-creating all of this knowledge to bring it back to a teacher. But there was no interaction with her with another individual other than that teacher on the technology field. And I don't know if that was a real teacher or a hologram. So I don't, um, that would be to say, how are we connecting them with their family? How are their families connecting with them as it relates to technology? Are we removing parents away from um, the educational piece of it? And then is that a problem as well? I do the same thing in restaurants. I actually sit and take assessments of how many families um, that have children, I specifically focus on ones with children, that have their technology devices out and that you, can't, you made the concerted effort to leave your home, get in your car, and drive away to a place to have dinner. However, you could have just ordered takeout and went home and just sat and did whatever you wanted to do. But we're sitting in a restaurant entirely texting or communicating via text the entire time. What does that say about how that whole paradigm shift is changing for our students and family? What is that social emotional piece? What has technology, technology done or not done for our students and families? The next one is number eight. Can technology change, manipulate, enhance the dispositional attributes of human beings and vice versa? So can technology change those dispositional attributes that your students may have? Can it change the attitudes, the values, the beliefs of, um, of what they may have? I do believe it can. I also believe that um, dispositional attributes can be um, changed depending upon the environment and depending upon who they're working with in regards to that. Number nine is, is the negative outcomes due to lack of social emotional learning, such as the echo effect, um, preserving the environment? So is, are these negative outcomes? When we look at negative outcomes, social emotional learning, for students that are socially connected and aware of what's going on in the environment, that whole echo effect, does it matter if students are not connected to our environment? Does it matter? If we, if we think about global warming, if we think about pollution, does it really matter if our students are really not connected? 
Number 10, is the purpose of education to promote business? So we know that through social emotional learning, it's important to be able to work as a team. Most businesses says that the things that our students are not getting when they walk into their doors for a job is their inability to think critically and to work together as a team. And if we are not teaching those skills early on, which a lot of people call those soft skills, if we are not teaching those skills that are related to social emotional learning, technology cannot do that, therefore our students are not gonna have um, jobs for the future because they are not able to connect and collaborate and have those collegial conversations at the tables that matter the most. Number 11 is what type of students are we creating? Are we creating half human, half robot? <laughs> That's a question left up to you, you determine that. Number 12, does technology increase teacher bias and prejudging? So having technology, I know they talked about, um, I think it was in China, um, where they have the, the data analytics where they're reading the students' faces and the teachers are giving all of this pre, um, preconditioned information about the child and who they are and where they came from and if they're paying attention. Um, is that giving you the opportunity to prejudge a child? Is that giving you too much data? Is it not giving you the opportunity to get to know your child or get to know each student on an individual basis? This is why most school systems do not allow any person to come out and check out a student's red folder, which is their entire queue folder, because you really don't want to have a teacher doing that at the beginning of the school year, so that you come up with all these pre-notions about students instead of getting to know that student on your own. Um, so is it creating some sort of disconnect? That piece of technology would certainly, I really personally don't care about all the analytics, um, about my students because if, they, if I can walk around as I'm supposed to as an instructional leader in that classroom and I'm supposed to be monitoring the educational process to ensure that they are getting what they need, I can tell that on myself as an expert instructional leader in that classroom. I can tell whether or not my students are authentically engaged or compliantly engaged. And I think that's something we may be moving away from, which I think we may need to move closer to because to me that becomes a disconnect between building a relationship with your students and not building a relationship with your students. If I can just, if we could just look at a sheet of paper and say, oh, here's the analytics for my students, whether or not they were paying attention. Well, what does that mean and what does that look like? Just because Johnny had his head down, Johnny may have a disability, but still be paying attention. It may be an auditory processing issue that he may be paying attention. However, if his head is down, that may be something completely different. Will technology be able to pick up on those things for our students that have varying exceptionalities? Number 12, does technology increase teacher bias and prejudging? We did that one. 13, legal aspects of technology relating to SEL and sharing information. So what are some of the legalities of sharing that information? How is that information going to be shared? Whom is it going to be shared with? And how is it going to be coded? Or if it will be coded and shared with those teachers? And as we know, anyone in education has always been told, the worst place to go at any school is where? If you're a teacher. Okay. Where? I heard it, the former te the teacher's lounge. So teachers talk. Teachers talk. And that, I think that's going to be to the end of history. Teachers talk. So if you have all this data, and you have all this information, and you're sharing it, and you're not really having the opportunity to get to know a student or their family or building those relationships with them, to me, continues to not only not bridge the gap of technology as it relates to social emotional, but I think it continues to widen that gap. Um, losing our human connections. Um, can technology teach authentic social and emotional learning? Someone at our table, I said, well, I said, I guess if you program it to do that, it could do that. So what, and, I, and then I would push back on that and say, so what does authenticity look like to you in your house? <coughs> so what authenticity may look like to me from a low poverty, um, very low performing um, school may look very different from what it looks like in a very um, suburban school where the parents are extremely affluent. And so authenticity to each of its own, will it be able to um, disassociate what those different things look like? Can technology help with the scale-up process, understanding students learn via different modes? And that kind of goes back to differentiated instruction. Is technology going to be able to differentiate the instruction that it's giving to the students due to the students' different needs? 
as classroom teachers and facilitators and instructional leaders, we know when our students don't get it. Will technology be able to do that? Will it be able to process the fact that my students may be dealing with something socially or emotionally that has happened at home or that may just happen in the hallway to be able to know that I need to change the lesson very quickly or I need to do something to modify because there's something going on in Susie's life that will, that will disassociate her from the lesson right now. So we're gonna skip that part for her and move on to the next uh, example. Will technology be able to do that? And I think our last one is, does technology connect or disconnect students from our community opportunities, experiential learning, and global connections? So student, when they're learning social emotional um, skills through technology, does it disconnect our students from going out and doing community work, community service, volunteering, um, going out to do experiential learning where they actually go out into the field and they're reflecting on it? I can do that on my iPad. I can go and monitor a classroom. I can just drop a pen and go right into that classroom via technology. How is that different? And does it disassociate our students with real authentic experiences that change at a whim versus technology where it's programmed? That's our last one. Wonderful. Just like other groups, you got me also excited about 6,000 different research projects in my mind, <laughs> which is going to take me 30 years to finish. But Okay, comments, questions about all these. They, they went through the research questions portion, which is also good. That's wonderful. It gives a lot of idea. I mean, I just want to say what all of your group has told me is about options. You know, in the hospitality industry, Ritz Carlton Hotel, right? Some of you may know Ritz Carlton, which is the highest in the spectrum there. People pay about $1,000 per night for a hotel room, yet they don't want to see anybody. They want to go to their room directly, check in through their mobile devices, but yet there are still a lot of people who would like to get that human touch. So in hospitality, we always tell our students, give your guests options. Give them the option to not see anybody. Same thing in education, I think. That's what I got from you. We need to do a lot of research about these options, what that might be. Just like somebody might be a very good learner when it comes to technology, some other person, a student, may learn just face to face. Those are, so putting everybody in one uh, basket, I think, is dangerous, right? So just for the sake, using technology for the sake of technology, I think, is not good. So I'm gonna come down there, I see your hand. Because we are recording on Facebook later. I, I ask you please to use the microphone. Okay. Um, I do think many of your questions are very, very fascinating and wonder how technology might open the doors to, you know, deeper learning, different ways of socializing and so forth. But then I sometimes sit back and just wonder if I'm old fat because I think about my parents. My parents, you know, thought we were talking on the phone too much, and that was when it was connected to a wall, and I watched too much TV, and that's when we had three channels, and, you know, listening to rock and roll was going to be the end of the life, you know, and so I oftentimes just sort of wonder if it's just generational. Yeah, I was wondering, um, this is the new normal. These are digital natives, and I wonder if teachers need to be trained. I mean, I think that, that um, you know, the, the whole MOOC classes, the, you know, the Coursera and all these, these uh, I think we really need to, to think of, um, when, you walk, when I walk into a classroom, I, all students are on their cell phones. I really don't wait for eye contact anymore. <laughs> that seems to be a thing for, 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 you know, for the, from the past. So I'm wondering if really we are not looking at as our, as ourselves as educators and saying how do we adapt our the learning experience to this new these new generations the millennials the Gen Xers Gen Ys or whatever other X, um, you know they call and seeing how do we connect with them and just like these um, online courses that are coming out at Stanford and other universities like the MOOCs MOOCs and, and Coursera etc are really looking at what outcomes do we want forced for our students and working backward and seeing how do we 
therefore adapt our learning style, our technical technology to suit our environment. So I can add to something that actually both of the ladies just said. So yes, I do believe it is um, a generational, um, I, we're being a little bit older, my husband always reminds me, what's wrong with the old way, the way we did everything? And I said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just moving forward with it. And I think the piece of it, I think that you address is, how do we as educators continue to move forward with the new generation? Yes, they are certainly um, digital natives. I think the question lies in the fact that it's not just the students that are digital natives, because if they're alone, the only digital natives and the teachers are the only digital natives that they're able to collaborate and communicate with, then what about the rest of society as well? And how does that relate to that still need of social emotional learning? I think if we only allow them to understand the impact that technology is the only way, then we have all of these situations where our students are able to hide behind technology, which is why I think we've had so many catastrophic things happen within our schools with school killings and things of that nature because students are able to hide behind technology versus have conversations with real individuals about real authentic problems. I think also you have to raise the question in your mind, is this a trend? which basically in five, six, seven years is going to disappear? Uh, or is it going to be a lifestyle change? Okay. So if you think it's going to be a lifestyle change, as we're sort of projecting that in 10 more years, and some of the videos that we saw you know, were sci-fi in a sense, as some of you might look at them. So, you know, sometimes things come and go. You know, hip-hop is what's cool few years ago, and now we're into hip hop again. <laughs> no, but you know, it's sort of like, you know, is it something that's going to keep on revolving back and forth? I mean, if, if, um, if you're into uh, The Voice, you have three country western singers that are in the top four, and one person who's singing basically, um, what would you classify it? not rock, but traditional music, okay? So it's like, there was a time when country western was cool in the 50s, and it sort of flattened out, and now you have a whole new generation of country western singers. So where are we going? You know, is, is this that important, or isn't that important? It's gonna be something that, and it seems that like it's gonna be something long-term, a lifestyle thing that we as teachers, educators, are gonna have to deal with and learn it, we have to and apply it in our classrooms and make the best out of it. So as was mentioned, it's yeah, there are choices. It, we can use it in a beneficial way and also we can ignore it and it could be a negative thing. Okay? So I think that's one of the other things that we discussed in our group that it's you as educators that have to make these decisions. And I think going back to that whole model, it's not just about the educators, and it's not just about us as um, instructional leaders at the higher level and or teachers in K through 12, but it goes back to that 360 model. Parents are working. They don't have the opportunity to go take trainings on this like we do every day for social emotional learning and how to adapt that. So how do we get that into their homes? How do we get it into the community that are unaware of actually what is taking place with their child? They may look very different when they're at home versus when they're at school. And so how do we create an environment that's supportive to those students as well on that continuous cycle? There's one comment here. So I, I was very touched by your comment about soft skills because I often feel that we educate about the neck and that's mostly our focus. We, we prefer cognition over fairness. And I wonder, is there a place in education to educate the heart? Because I think self-understanding is an incredibly valuable educational outcome. Like even the Oracle in Delphi, the first thing is know, know thyself, know yourself. So what it takes to know ourselves, and you know, we talk about knowledge, but we don't really talk about wisdom. We talk about information and big data, but we don't talk about like relationship and how to relate to each other. You mentioned climate change. I mean. Don't save the world out of guilt, but save it out of love and compassion. But how you develop those 
It's curious. I think developing compassion and mindfulness is just as a rigorous practice as developing like cognitive skills. Right. And I think with technology, we're also promoting a kind of disembodied like learning. It's connection, yes. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely and wholeheartedly agree with everything you just stated. I truly believe that until we begin to educate the heart, we're not going to educate the mind. Some of the things I think are the responsibility of families, and those responsibilities have been shifted to school, and it's one of the things that we talked about, and schools are being asked to do more and more and more. So you have to draw the line somewhere. I think family has to take over some of the responsibility towards traditional family responsibilities. So we had a member who I think left, he was pointing out that the technology it will be there and it's there to help us. We have to choose technology that has a purpose to serve. We all choose technology for the sake of choosing technology, but those that has a purpose, that, that way we can make it beneficial. Wonderful. Great. One more round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now on this group, right? Last but not least. I think this is the last group. Is that right? Am I, am I correct? Yeah. Who's going to come from your group? Okay, you're gonna do all. Oh, wow, that's great. I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> you can do it right here. So be careful. This is a little bit um, fragile. It's not very strong. So. There you go. Who should I give the microphone? Who's gonna talk? Um, okay. So our are you gonna come? I can come as well. Yes. behind 
why they made it the way they did. Um, so we also said that um, education should help students live a fulfilled life, and I might turn it over to you on this one, um, and it's more than developing skills for industry, but what about wisdom, what about creativity, what about enjoyment? So I always wonder about this because the word education means to draw out, and I think we often suppose that you know there's nothing that students can bring to the, the table, but uh, I am fascinated by this notion of what it means to live a good life, and and if if education should help us to know what is good and what is good quality, and in terms of quality, we talked about this idea of nourishment. So like using the analogy of the food, that we know that fast food is mildly attractive and gives us some happiness, but, but it's not really nourishing. So how to find an educational model that actually nourishes our lives? And, you know, with technology, I, I wonder if, if, like, if, if we have like an economic system that puts a tremendous value on technology, are we just attracted to technology because it's popular and it's economically viable? Even though, like, with biotechnology, we have also less and less emphasis on the role of humanities. So imagine a generation growing up uh, buying technology but never reading Orwell 1984 or Zamyatin V or Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. So I think there is a balance that's needed, and, and I think. As educators, we kind of have to maintain this homeostasis of balance of, of what is important and why it's important. Okay, um, and I'm going to piggyback off of what you said and jump down to this. Um, but we also talked about um, in education, uh, we're not really teaching students how to relate to technology. Um, so it's not really a matter of use, but um, how to critically evaluate how should I use this technology or whether I should even use this technology in the first place. Um, and so we um, would go back a lot to the um, teacher preparation. So if professors aren't um, thinking in this mindset um, to train the future teachers who are going into the classroom, uh, they're not going to be able to teach that to uh, the students. So we um, talked about that as well. Um, we talked about how uh, we had a discussion about how uh, kind of what this group over here is talking about, um, how technology is used in different uh, locations. So geography and location determines how technology is integrated and used. Um, so it's not that any one place is doing it better or worse, or something's wrong, it's just that's what that region, um, that location needs. Um, and then um, we talked about um, policy, um, because we cannot escape the role that policy plays in all of us, because policy determines um, the pacing of how we teach in the classroom, it determines how the teachers are um, trained, it determines the funding uh, because here in the United States, a very local uh, funding is very locally um, focused. Um, it determines metrics for success. So um, we also discussed the role that policy plays uh, in all of that. And so we went a step further and created this uh, kind of graphic, like he was saying, our metaphor of being at this table. So quality of education is like uh, this big table and you're sitting down to a good meal. Um, so we had a discussion of what is, what, how to define quality, what does it mean good, uh, because someone in one part of the country might say something is a good education, whereas someone else might say what's good, so we have good in um, parentheses. Um, we talked about um, playfulness, because uh, a lot of times um, we got into a discussion about gaming, um, game-based learning, game-based assessment, um, and where we see uh, the entertainment industry and how the students are engaged. Because we talked about the nine second um, um, attention span, um, but we're like, no, because kids spend <laughs> hours on games and they are learning. Um, so what we can learn from you know uh, the game 
games industry, uh, but just having that um, sense of playfulness when we implement um, and integrate technology, as um, he said, it should be nourishing. Um, we talked about something called the slow down ontology. So, you know, we were talking about how technology, um, because it is going so fast, um, that it helps us slow down. And you might be able to explain this better than I did. Um, but I'm just going to touch on these things. Um, but we talked about pedagogical needs, values, wisdom. So all of this is this table with all the things we all felt um, were part of a quality education. Um, but anyone else can bring to the table what they believe is a quality education um, using technology. But oh, here we have this chair uh, that says who gets to sit at the table. And that's because we're taking that critical view. So um, if you don't have all those stakeholders at the table, um, and I pointed out at this, um, even at this think tank, if there are not students in here, if there are not teachers, teachers at Title I schools, um, if we don't have all the perspectives, um, we really can't come up with truly viable solutions if all and transformative um, solutions if all the stakeholders are not at the table and they are um, also saying what quality uh, education is. And we did have um, a research question that came out of this. We were looking at um, what would be the relationship between uh, mastery of the domain and creativity and looking at what kinds of uh, foundational skills are needed and how they affect creativity and at, in what way and um, um, and to what degree. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but when the word cloud was there with the trends and the issues in education, creativity was not prominent. I don't even know if creativity was there as a word. And it's kind of shocking because clearly we can't predict the future. Like, we don't know how in 30 years the world will look like. But I think creativity is an essential skill that we can actually deal with those problems. If we become flexible, if we are innovative, if we can generate ideas and solutions quickly and, and improvise, I think that's the solution to deal with an uncertain future. And I think creativity should play a, a dominant role in a quality education. Excellent. You want to add more? No, no, no. This is a very good. I, I'm very impressed. Uh, I was planning to put this in use almost more than half or something because <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great, great. I love uh, that. I love that metaphor. Yeah. No, I think uh, you really got me thinking a lot. I, I, I love each and every group bring different ideas, and it, it's amazing. Like what what you guys have uh, come up with, and you know, in terms of. Um, what you are saying, what I got from your group, is uh, creating the best mix. Again, it comes to the option, right? I, gave, I love the analogy that you did with fast food. It's, it's, it makes you happy. Everybody would like to eat. It's finger food, right? But yet, is it uh, you know, nourishing uh, to find that, that balance? You know, I, we have a teaching hotel. Uh, a long go key club here. So when our students go there, they work for the whole day, they shadow. And none of them are bored, but in the class, you open the PowerPoint, they say from inside, of course, now I said boring, but they don't, of course, say anything to the teacher. But, you know, PowerPoint poisoning, right? We heard about that. So how do we, you know, they didn't have creativity. I'm also surprised that in that word cloud that I did, I, I, I don't think I've seen creativity there, which is so important. Um, but. At the same time, people were talking about like the mode of instruction. What is the, the, the best mix and how do you actually create the delivery method that's best for each uh, student, right? That's, I think technology can come to rescue there. That's adoptive technology. will take care of that boring, which is the transfer of information from, from the teacher to the student that can take care by the by the you know computers or artificial intelligence, whatever that you call. But the rest, I think, s still stays with the with the instructor. So, any questions for this group before I go too much? Uh, here, I will bring the microphone. I have a comment, not a question. When you talk about the slowdown, cat um, thought 
There's a, a movement referred to as a slow movement in education. Are you familiar with that? And I, I was thinking of it as you said that, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, I just became familiar with it recently. It started in the UK, and essentially it's this paradigm shift in education with the idea that we have gone to fast education like fast foods and now if you revert for the same reasons for the nourishment back to slow education meaning in my mind as a science educator I think of uh, the more more less is more more in depth more freedom to think more opportunity and necessity to be creative in contrast to the um, what is it, the, the, the mile, mile wide and inch deep to, to reverse that. Exactly. And also what yours, uh, I forgot to say last time, problem-based learning. That was also in the, in the you know, one of the trends, uh, problem-based problem learning where people really take uh, more creativity, they can just shine out. But of course, there is the content that we have to give them. I guess that's a game with the computers. Any other comment for this group before we open it up for all groups? Anybody have anything to add us them? Did Perfect. You, behind, me. behind me, okay, here we go. Did you guys think of um, global standardization of quality of education and relating that to portability of qualifications and stuff? Did you get the question? I said, but did, you, did you guys examine the whole idea of standardization oh, globally of um, education quality and the whole process of you know, portability of qualifications? Right, right. We talked about quality, but uh, uh, there were two sides of it. Either that quality is defined differently by different regions or different people, so there is no universal definition of quality education, that was one of the issues. The other aspect is that uh, when people are moving between states and countries and so on, they move everywhere, then it will be very difficult if there is not a uh, uh, some, some defined definition of quality, because then somebody recruits someone, he is not sure what, he is what is the what well, does he know who is recruiting if quality is defined differently? So it's a diffi difficult aspect to deal with, but overall we found that quality is different as what the group mentioned. It is culturally and it is, uh, is defined uh, from the community from, from many perspectives. Probably as, you, as, as we think about this, I know Europe is, um, has a big project now on this global st standardization of quality of education. This started about four four years ago, and they are doing some work on that. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think we do it too. We need to take a look. Great. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We have perfect timing. We have about let's say 15, 20, or 30 minutes, depending on, we said that we're gonna be done by three, so it's 2.15, that's perfect. I know that we are not giving break, uh, we are kind of like non-stop crazy, going, but if you feel like it, you know where the coffee is, and we know where the restrooms are going. So, now, one million dollar question. We got a question from Facebook audience. Is this, this, you know, we said education 2030, so the future of education, right, this think tank, they are asking us, are we going to keep our jobs? Are we, we is the professors in universities in 10, 20 years. In other words, do, does this group believe that there will be no need for us, which is going to be replaced by all these technologies that you mentioned or etc. What are your thoughts about that? Okay, I'll start from here. There's going to be a greater need for us as human beings than there even is now because the technologies are not able to do the human part and the relationship building. And in fact, if I understand
understood the conversation earlier about transformational and transactional education, I, in my mind, that what's being said about transact transformational is really relationship education, and that there's going to be a greater need for that because people are isolated by the technologies as they get information. Perfect, wonderful. I'll go here and then next week. Okay, well, who's that saying? I'm first. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah, three over here. I disagree. <laughs> I think the trend is starting now that. Um, it's okay to disagree, right? Yeah. I can disagree, right? Yeah. That right now, the trend is starting. And let me give you an example. Um, in my university, um, probably right now, uh, over the last uh, five years, we went from about 450 full-time faculty to 140. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Where is this? And King University in New Jersey. And King University, New Jersey. Yeah. And the trend is to hire a lecturer. A 12 month, 12 month lecture that has no tenure in their their clause. So and there's no such thing as overload. So they they work for 12 months during the summer. Uh, they have to teach two two courses, uh, summer session one and one is summer session two. Uh, they have no say, uh, they have no contribution really to the, the department or school. They have the fear of being eliminated. Uh, and, uh, this, this past year, about uh, 20 lecturers were eliminated. So you think that we will not have this job in the next 10, 20 years? I think to be, or it's going to be diminished. I, I think it's going to be very difficult to get into higher education. Okay, okay, that's okay. great. Well, let's hear you and then I'll come to you. I think there's going to be lesser number of full-time faculty. But I think I agree with him, there's a trend now. But I think the trend is going to reverse itself after a while when the universities realize that the quality of education is going down. And if they want to improve the quality again, they'll have to hire full-time faculty members. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. I'll give the microphone to you. Uh, if anybody else, just, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the first two speakers were addressing different parts of the problem. Uh, I do agree that Technology changes our role, and I think whether we have jobs or not depends on whether we are willing to learn um, and change with that. Uh, just like any other job, we have to keep keep up with what, what is the latest in the field. And you don't have to use everything, but you at least have to know they exist and whether they are useful to you or not. Um, so that, dip, that, like any other job out there, I think depends on how much we keep up. Uh, the second part of it is, relates to uh, the, the structure of uh, faculty employment, and that is different. We could still be uh, teachers and educators and uh, be let, uh, like the gentleman here mentioned, or we could be tenure profs, and I think that depends on the extent to which research is a big part of what the university is. If the university does not spend on research and make research a primary criteria, uh, it becomes nothing but a bastion of lecturers, and at that point, it becomes an issue for uh, any administration to justify anything. Uh, but I think one of the biggest issues is going to be how do we justify the kind of research we do, and how can we do it better and faster and make it more applicable instead of taking 10 years to publish a paper. Uh, by which time the industry has moved on because they go at terrible speeds. So particularly in business, I know for sure that we have to move like the industry does, otherwise they leave us behind. I'm assuming science and other places it takes longer. So I, I think that's where the criteria is. And I, I'm a CT professor. A CT is someone who doesn't have tenure but can be promoted, like a clinical professor. Um, and I strongly uh, urge my university not to hire more than 25% of my kind of people because people with tenure are what protect the university set up to the university. So that is a different question, and I think the different question here is, we, we can keep our jobs, the short answer, we can keep our jobs if we are willing to learn for the sake of our jobs. Perfect, thank you. Right here. Uh, give it to me, and I'm gonna come there. Uh, hello, uh, as 
I said, I teach at the university in Bangladesh. Before coming here, I took a survey of my students. I teach four courses, so I took a survey of them, asking them about online courses and whether they like doing online courses, whether they would prefer online lecture to traditional way of lecture. And most of them, they preferred, they said they preferred online lecture, yes, because of time flexibility, because of many other factors. And then my final question was that, okay, so if I design my course for the next semester, would you prefer that I put up my lectures on Moodle? That's the learning platform, online learning platform, yeah. and I don't, then I don't have to come to class, and you can also view my lectures from home, and they all went, no! <laughs> so they were saying, yeah, they love it, but when you want to implement it in reality, they don't want it. And then the question came, why not? Just now you were saying that you would prefer online courses and online learning and everything, so why not? It's better for you and me, for both the parties. They said they wanted the interaction, they wanted the teacher to answer their questions, they wanted the interaction with each other, all these factors matter to them more. Interesting. You know, on the other coin over here, I'm going to come to you, you raise your hand. I, I teach an online class, Canvas, we use yeah. Canvas as a learning management system here. Guess what time is the most active peak time for students to uh, come to the classroom system and do activities. Yeah. Any, any idea? Yeah. Yeah. 2 a.m. Yeah. 2 a.m. You know what gives the statistics? I'm going to come to you. She asked for... So think about that as well. To me, the biggest uh, thing that would need to change to avoid eliminating faculty positions is we have to change our view of what higher education is. If we see it as transmitting knowledge, that will be gone. You can get on the internet and get that knowledge through Khan Academy, any kind of thing like that, and you don't need a faculty member. But if you see higher education as something that engages in problem solving, creativity, some of the conversations earlier about cultural relevance, understanding other people, working on problem-based types of things, you have to have people, and then you have to have faculty who are orchestrating and connecting those things. So to me, it's got to be a shift away from knowledge transmission, or yes, we will be gone. Yeah. You've seen the Yuki, right? That that uh, robot there. You, you want to say something? Oh. I, I, I don't think um, faculty is going to be eliminated. It's probably the type, the 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 area now that are required to be those people who can focus on technology. I give an example in medicine now. Um, in the olden time, you need to go and bring um, a cadaver from somewhere, sit down, <laughs> the professor is there with you over the cadaver and you're dissecting. These days, the professor is somewhere else, it's a simulation, and you are there, he doesn't even need to be with you, but he's seeing everything you're doing, and that professor can grade you whether you're doing well in that particular assignment or not. Another example is clinical practice in education, and I teach educational leadership, and we used to think of, in those days, I used to go to the schools, sit down with the principal, observe this, and you know, all of that stuff. But now, there are technologies we can use to monitor exactly what is going on, how the supervisory process is going on, and we have all that rubric sent to the um, mentor and coach, and those can be graded, and all of us can have conversation, real time, synchronously. So, it's, as I said again, the faculty are not going to be eliminated, but you need to polish your skills. You need to be updated. There is Eco 360, which can record the classes, and, you know, and then you can just shoot it to your student, and it's a real classroom, and it's so many things. So, this is what Yes, I agree. I'm going to come here. This is Ty. I did not forget you. I was going to say, there are things that um, machines, technology, are really good at doing, and there are things that humans are really good at doing. Um, so teachers and professors are not going to be replaced anytime soon. Um, if you look at the research on um, where artificial intelligence is at, like there's a misconception that, oh, we're all going to be replaced huh. by robots. Um, but the um, technology is not there yet. It's actually, if you uh, look at the... Um, expert it's like decades away so uh, AI is not at the point where it can reason and synthesize and process um, with creativity and emotion like a human being um, it's just not there and it takes an integrated system of like cognitive system robotics um, and the data piece and so we are not at that point um, but to what some of the other people are saying um, 
just the model for um, higher education um, doesn't work <laughs> right now. And there's also um, research that shows professors rate themselves um, as teachers and lecturers much higher than the students do. So that's why they don't go and get professional development. Um, so as some of you are saying, you need to, you know, hey, I'm doing a great. Um, no, you're probably not. So you probably <laughs> need to, um, you know, take the hint. And then there's also um, a report I was just uh, reading as well where the skills that students feel they need to be successful after they leave the university and the skills that professors believe they need um, don't mesh as well. So you need to keep abreast of all those things. Um, and plus the skills that the uh, business industry is requiring. So no, none of those are aligned. Um, so we're not going to be replaced. I'm a librarian by training, and um, my, my field has been looking at this for a while. First, when we got the internet, they said, that's going to replace libraries. We won't need any, anybody. Everybody can get anything they want online. And that didn't happen. And then, when we started digitizing everything and we had um, e-books, they said, that's for sure the end of libraries. <laughs> and we're still getting students in the programs. We're still placing students in jobs. And libraries are transforming. And so it, we'll probably, our, our positions will probably change. Um, and, and it sounds, from, from everything we're saying, like that's um, something that needs to happen. That's probably not going away. Absolutely. Yes, I'm going to come back to Dr. Chunk right here. She's third year in a row. Never misses Glosser. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, higher education will is being looked at as a business. Universities have become uh, have moved from becoming being academic institutions to businesses. That is definitely here to stay. The public attitude towards higher education has changed in that people are questioning what is the role of the university. Yeah. Um, if the role of the university is to provide teaching, the teaching can be done in all different forms. If the role of the university is to provide research, then the discussion has to be what therefore is, um, can we do public-private partnerships, like the former, uh, former speaker said, how do we, I think that is where we as faculty have to be focused on. What is, um, what is our emphasis on research? Because teaching can be done, I think. Um, so I think the public attitude towards education, um, I think also that, um, you know, the, 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 um, the whole mind, mindset towards having a degree, having that accreditation, even by students, the amount of student loans, the amount of loans that students have to take out to get a degree. That is really center, is a centerpiece in, in the discussion. So all of these factors need to be taken into account um, when we look at what the, as the, the whole education think tank is about, where higher education is headed. I, I don't think that the train, we can stop the train right now. It's moving, it's a business, it's how do we get on board with that and, and move in that direction. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want to chip into this topic? Okay, here we go. Let's, and then we're going to go into the next. You might think I'm a negative bird here, but uh, I'm in a situation where certain things are happening uh, in reference to higher education. One is that it is a business. Uh, faculty have to do uh, accountability forms every two weeks. It means we have to actually uh, chart what we do for 34 hour, uh, 35 hours in two weeks, or a week I should say. Um, the uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs uh, is in the process of turning the library into 100% virtual library. Uh, librarians are being laid off, uh, so that's gonna be history in a few years. Uh, so there are things that are happening. Uh, and they, they don't sound good, but they are happening, and they are happening in the situation I'm in. Uh, so I've been in education for quite a few years, and I've seen this different trends occur. And this trend is real. We, business is becoming a business. 
but I mean, education, higher education is a business, and I foresee that it's going to continue to happen. So, I agree with uh, some portions of what you said. I'll give you one example. You know, we, I teach hospitality technology. That's my uh, area of, of teaching. When I start teaching the class, of this class, I always show that fruit basket. You know, that when you go to a hotel, sometimes you see a fruit basket, right? They send you some kind of, and I tell them, I, I show them the fruit, imagine that there's a fruit basket here, and then I tell you, I tell the students, what is the relationship of this fruit basket to technology? So they say, oh, professor, is the apple, digital apple that you eat and it beeps? I said, no, that's not it. So what the, 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 the connection there, and I, I challenge them to think about it, is this. Hospitality is becoming a technology organization, so as I told you before, and I'll t explain how with this fruit basket. So you take a fruit basket, you put that in a guest's guest room, so that guest comes in, checks in, and sees the fruit there, very happy. And then there is an apple, there is a banana, there is a strawberry there, so he or she eats one of them, the banana and the strawberries, doesn't touch the apples. And the room service clerk comes back to the room and observes what has been eaten because those fruit baskets are standard. And then puts that into the guest's profile. So this is unsolicited observation because if I ask Dr. Sam, what is your most favorite fruit or fruits? And if he tells me kiwi, but I don't have kiwi, he will be disappointed. But if I unsolicited observation, I observe him, right, what he eats, what he does in the hotel, and then use technology to keep record of it. So when he comes to the same hotel chain six months later in another location, instead of Hong Kong now, San Francisco, his fruit basket will be dominated by the fruits that he has eaten before. So when I go to a hotel, my Marriott hotel, they never put coffee or green tea in my room because they observe that I only drink Earl Grey tea. So I've got four packages of Earl Grey tea. The things that I like and do, so this is strategic competitive advantage, right? So I, I, I challenge my students with this thinking that, yes, do you have to be a technologist to know this? No, right? We don't have to know how that PMS system, property management system, check in check out system actually does this, but we need to know that I need that information to be able to act on it later, right? So I think all of uh, what, from what you have said, what I understand is that teaching is here to stay, but the way that we teach, the way that our jobs are going to entail, what it entails are going to change. We have to update ourselves, uh, otherwise we'll be out of the loop. I sometimes have uh, colleagues uh, from different universities. I ask them, how many hours do you teach? What's your teaching load, right? I'm sure that you ask each other because you're curious about what's your research support, travel, money, and all that stuff, so we ask. So one of my colleagues just recently told me that he's teaching 28 hours. I said, what? I thought I, was, I, I mis, misheard. He says, no, 28 hours per week. And the reason is that the pay is not enough, it's an adjunct faculty. He is teaching in five different institutions and he's making half of what he would make normally as a one full-time job in a university. So how could you expect one faculty member who's teaching 28 hours to be creative, to keep updated with the new technologies or the new, new, new teaching methods or do research, right? That's not gonna happen. So somebody said about, I don't know, one of you said about adjunct faculty being, or faculty, like they are teaching more and more. That one was of one of the trends actually. Uh, misuse of adjunct and instructors. Yeah. Lecturers, lecturers at Cade University are teaching 38 mm -hmm. hours a year. 38 hours a year? So that's semester. about 20, 20 hours per, per, per one semester. 30 hours, 15 hours per semester, and they have to teach. So five courses. Right, and they have to teach nine hours, excuse me, it's 39, they have to teach nine hours without extra pay during the summer, that's 39 hours. I, I would submit that there is a significant difference between the word teach and the word learn. And that if we're in the business, if we think that K through
through 16 in graduate school is in the business of helping people learn, we behave in one way. If we're in the business of teaching, it's possible and reasonable to behave in another way. And if universities are in the business of helping people learn and having professors continue to learn, whether the learning is through research or through professional development, if we're in the business of learning, then we'll be in business indefinitely. And until we separate the teaching word from the learning word, we're going to be going around in circles in our debates and we're going to be having a terrible time politically trying to make our points. Yep, perfect. Anybody else? We are almost to the end of the session here. Does anybody have any general comments? Yes. Okay. Uh, one thing about <clears throat> if the uh, uh, teachers job will be uh, available in the future or not, uh, I assume that as long as we need marketers, we need teachers. Uh, because of that, uh, what marketers do, they try to make people aware that they have a product, they promote the product, and motivate, to pe make, motivate people to buy it. Actually, every people knows the product, we know the product, because uh, in internet we can search. However, we still need marketers uh, to buy the product or have, uh, be motivated. So, especially in social science, all knowledge are available on the internet and everywhere. However, we still teach psychology, we still teach uh, sociology, accounting, or other uh, areas. <coughs> 30 years ago, when I used to work as an accountant, uh, the business owners told that if you buy two computers, we don't need those two people to do jobs. Yes, computers eliminated many of the jobs, re repeated the jobs, but today we still need those accountants, especially analysts, uh, to uh, advise people about uh, company financial statements or future or so. Uh, I guess uh, there will be some transformation in, in the jobs of teaching, teaching. However, still will be uh, a job in the future, and I don't think we'll disappear in the next at least 20 years, 30 years or so. And again, I remember a cartoon uh, drawn in the 1930s, imagining that people by the 2000 will fly, there will be a flying car, and they will all fly. They will go to home job with flying cars. Actually, it was a good imagination, but as of 2019, it, it we still do not have flying cars. Some prototypes, yeah. Yes, yeah, some, yes, uh, but not yet. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll tell you what happened to me in Las Vegas. Um, you talk about uh, universities being run as businesses. I think uh, in fields where there's a lot of funding available, there'll be more jobs growing and in fields where there's not funding, then there'll be more part-time people, uh, instructors and uh, less of uh, full-time faculty members. That's right. my prediction. Yes, exactly. That's wonderful. You know, I was in uh, Las Vegas uh, one month ago, and then I went there. I want to get Lyft, you know, Uber and Lyft, the same idea, and then I, I, I opened the app of Lyft. Of course, you always compare the price, right? Which one is cheaper? Uh, and then I did, and then I wanted to order Lyft, and I got an email immediately. It said that, Dr. Jihan, would you like to get an uh, autonomous car? <laughs> so they start using 3,000 cars in Las Vegas that doesn't have drivers. So speaking about changing jobs, right? Librarians were talking about this, teachers and all that stuff. So there will be no taxi drivers anymore. Because I didn't get it, because I opted in to get an autonomous car, uh, because there is some risks. Uh, so there is now ethical questions, actually. You know, we didn't really touch ethics in this think tank here, but there is also a lot of ethics in terms of technology. 
You know what scientists are, uh, researchers are talking about? When an autonomous car is about to make an accident, and if the accident is inevitable, who should it kill first? People are talking about it. Old woman is number one. Old man is number two. Fat man is number two. <laughs> I'm out of here. So. <laughs> and goes all the way to the stroller. So if there's a kid in the stroller, that needs to be killed the, the last. I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's, it's in, in fact, it's kind of like also sad too, right? We are talking about these things. So the way that we, we uh, are doing everything is changing. And, and I got a lot of wonderful information from this thing. Thank, I would like to thank each of you for participating. It's a long day that you're staying, still sticking to it. What's next? Let me tell you what we are going to do next. And then if you, obviously you will all get credit for attending the, this think tank. So that's, that's number one. The goal is A, to write a short white uh, paper. As we have said, the white paper is going to 30,000 feet of the discussions. And we'll have a lot of research questions at the end. And for this, I need volunteers. At least one volunteer from each group that's going to summarize what your group has said. And Katrina, my uh, assistant here, is going to take the pictures. We have the videos. I will email all of them to you. You will have a depository very soon. You will have all the recordings from this session, all these other groups also, uh, posters that they have written. And then uh, you will have it a month to write this findings, white paper. And then I also will ask you to volunteer for writing the research papers, for some of the research questions that we got here. If we get six articles, we will publish a special issue. Let me tell you about these thought pieces, right? These are going to be thought pieces or review literature or sometimes the analysis of this think tank results. They are the ones that are going to be cited a lot. So if you care about citations, which is another topic that we can talk for a whole day, <laughs> right? The quality of education, quality of professors, how, you know, quantifiable, right? Teaching is ratemyprofessor.com becomes like the thing or that what you get from your students, at least in America, your result from students who rate you becomes your you know, uh, evaluation of how good you're teaching versus how many citations you get. But if you care about that, that's, that's a very good way of getting a lot of citations. I did one thought piece about three years ago that was about the think tank about uh, hospital technology. That paper was cited almost 500 times in three years. Uh, so that's that's a lot of things. So I, you feel free to come to me after we are done in a few minutes. Uh, let me know, write your paper name if you want to be a volunteer A for the white paper, B for the research. Research, we can create teams, okay? And we can do this virtually. So once we have some research ideas, you can create your own teams or you can pick the people self-selected. Four people, five people, even six people are appropriate when we are doing think tanks to co-author a paper. And as the editor, co-editor of JGAR, Journal of Global Education Research, I would love to have this special issue published in our journal. And we, like I said, we pub, uh, applied to be in Scopus, ESCI, and also ABD, uh, Australian Business Dean's list, all, all of them. Hopefully will be accepted soon, and of course, Doaj as well, Director of Open, uh, Open Access Journals and would like to do that. Any last minute questions or comments before we end up? Hearing none, I would like, yes. Would you send the email address? Yes, I will send all participants' emails to you. Please don't share them outside of this group, obviously, right? So yes, everybody will get the, each other's uh, address. I will create a website for it. As a matter of fact, this is my contact information. Some of you asked me about the presentation in the morning. That presentation, believe it or not, I just put it together yesterday. <laughs> I was looking at those trends, and it's not really like, I mean, I, I, I've been thinking about it, of course, but I really uh, just did it last night. It actually was like 1.30 1 a.m. when I finished that. Uh, so if you want a copy, it will be available on my website, jihan.org, or chobalan.com, which is my last name. So they are all there, and on a yes. I just want to thank you for putting this together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. And it's, a, it's a joy. It's a pleasure. I mean, I get, I get so excited. I get so energized by these research ideas. 
And some of you will stay here for Glossary. It's going to open tomorrow. I think 8 o'clock is the first concurrent session. Then we have the 10, 10 o'clock or 10.30. I have the schedule over there. Uh, the opening ceremony uh, will have wonderful conference. If you're staying there, I will see you at the conference. If not, thanks for coming. Safe journey wherever you are going. And then hope to see you in another conference or in another location. Thanks.